I'm Peter Paterno. I'm a partner at King Holmes Paterno in Berliner, and we're here in my office. Uh, music lawyer, depending on the level, music lawyer, uh, well, primarily a music lawyer that negotiates contracts for recording artists. That's, that's the sort of bulk of the work. Um, on some level also is involved with the, with the artists, if the artists are also writers. Uh, in other words, they weren't on American Idol. Um, you, they also negotiate their music publishing contracts. And that, that's, there, there's a lot that, that stems off of that that's the primary focus of what you do as a music lawyer. I, m my background before I was a music lawyer was, was in general practice. And so I'm sort of um, able to handle some of the other problems or at least know where to turn on some of the other problems um, that artists may have, um, you know, typical artist problems like drug busts and drunk driving and things like that. But you know, they buy houses, they have divorces, and uh, they look to you, artists look to you as your their primary legal source on all those kind of issues, even though you may know very little about it, or in the case of most music lawyers, nothing about it. Which, by the way, is not a good thing. I mean, music lawyers should learn about those kinds of things, but most of them don't. Our firm, and again, uh, m most all music lawyers are different. Um, I started out in a big full-service law firm. I started out at Manat Phelps, which is, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of lawyers now, and I think pretty much covers every, every area. My firm now is much smaller, but we actually have a, a corporate and real estate practice and, and uh, litigation practice. Um, so we're pretty much full-service for an artist other than criminal matters. Uh, criminal matters that get serious. I mean, we can, we, I, can go funk, uh, I can go fake a drunk driving arraignment. Um, but so serious criminal matters or tax stuff, uh, we bring in outside tax counsel and, and family law when they finally do get that divorce. We try not to handle, uh, uh, we try not to handle, I get stuck, stuck and sucked into those things too. I was, I was a general practitioner for just a year and a half. Then I, then I went to work at Manat Phelps as a music lawyer. And I did that for 10 years, and, uh, or longer. And um, uh, Michael Eisner decided he wanted to start a record company, and he called me up, and I talked to him. And at some point, he decided he wanted me to start the record company. And, and uh, so that's what I did. I, so I, I'd always wanted to. I, I really actually did want to um, be more involved in the music business and the record business than just being a lawyer. So it was actually a pretty easy decision for me to make. I, like I said, I started out, I, I played in bands, I was terrible. Um, then I, um, um, well, I went to college, then I went to grad school, and then I went and I wrote software. And uh, I, I used to write software for the space shuttle. And remember it blew up, I think that was my software. No, no I'm just joking about that. I, it was many years after I left. It was somebody else's software. But, but that was my training. Was in, I was a math major. I did math. And, and, uh, and one thing you learn when you're in math is that, that uh, a guy that's great in math is so on another planet from anybody else. I mean, the math geniuses, like, they, you know, they really are different. And I realized that, that I might be good in math, but I would never be that. So I had to go find some place where the people weren't quite as smart, and I found law school. So I, I went off to law school and I did that for a while and uh, then I got out and didn't know what I wanted to do. So I started a firm where I think I talked about this before. I just did general practice for like a year and a half, you know, dog bite cases. And what kind of got me off that is I had done a divorce for some woman and, and she called up at four in the morning and said, you know, my, my husband here, he's, he, he's got a gun and he wants the couch. Didn't I get the furniture in the divorce? And I go, what, what, he's got a gun? Give him the goddamn couch, you know? so. I figured, well, that's enough of this. So um, I heard there was an opening. Actually, it's very funny. This is my, my current partner, Howard King, was doing music law at Manat Phelps. And he hated the person he was working for and calls me up and says, if you know anybody that wants a job doing music law, I'm about to quit. So I applied for the, the job at Manat Phelps, and they ultimately hired me. And so that's how I started doing music law. So I did that for. I did that for like 12 years and then uh, um, got the job running Hollywood Records at Disney and that was a colossal failure and, and uh, at the end of four years they, they fired, well, they didn't fire me, I, my contract yet, my contract technically ended but I prefer to think of it as I was fired. And then I, um, 
Then I moved back into private practice. Well, I spent a year trying to get a real job because I really, being a lawyer is just not all that much fun. And I was going, God, I can't do that again. And then after about a year where I couldn't get anybody to hire me because I was basically a, uh, well, persona non grata in any business, <laughs> I, I had to slink back to practicing law again. And uh, so that's, that's what I've now done since then. And it still isn't all, all that much fun. And the way I met Metallica was, uh, Early on in their career, um, they were uh, they were um, they were on a they were on a label called Megaforce, and they were managed by the guy that ran Megaforce and published by the guy that ran Megaforce. Um, and Cliff Bernstein, uh, their current manager, called me up and said, "You should check this band out. These guys are really amazing." And uh, and he had Lars Ulrich give me a call, and I met with them and. I still remember the first time I saw them play. This was like, you know, 1982 or three. They, and I, had, I had no idea who they were, and the music was a little bit, I'd have to say, foreign to what I was listening to at the time. Just didn't really sound much like the Eagles or Jackson Brown. Um, so uh, I went and saw them play a show at the Palace. And I mean, I could listen to the music, and I went, you know, this is really good, but I just don't get it. And, uh, but I could tell it was good, but it was just, you know, it wasn't what I was really used to. And I went and saw them play the Palace, and. And I, I remember walking out of that thing and just turning to nobody in particular saying, James Hetfield is Jesus Christ. I mean, he was that amazing. It was that, you know, didn't know the songs, didn't know them. It was just amazing. So uh, anyway, so it was from Cliff that I, that I met with Metallica. And uh, then, you know, I looked at their situation, which it wasn't the most favorable. Uh, a bad record deal on an independent label with not only their own publishing or their... Uh, management and my first job was to get them out of that and that's that's what I did and, and then they got they went on and hired Cliff and Peter Manch and we've been together for a really long time <laughs> in terms of of shopping um, it's something you do a lot more when you're younger and trying to establish a clientele it was a lot different also back when I started out actually A&R people had the ability to sign artists which they don't much have anymore uh, um, you know, there was there was much there were many more signings going on, and there was much more of an active, uh, you know, um, uh, NR community. The NR function I've sort of noticed as, as I've kind of observed it is more directed. I mean, realistically, at white rock bands. I mean, you know, and these sort of like critics all sit around and talk about them. The the NR function, the NR people are not so much like in hip hop or R and B. Those tend to come in from other places, not from lawyers shopping them. Um, and so, um, so as hip hop becomes more prevalent, the shopping becomes less. As rock becomes less prevalent, the shopping becomes less. As people get signed less, shopping becomes less. And as you get older, like 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 me, you just can't put up with it anymore. You can't put up without with sending out ten CDs and nobody responding, and the artist calling you up and saying what's going on, and the guy hasn't listened to it. It's a very frustrating process, and ultimately, not all that fruitful. And in fact, when I used to do a lot of shopping, um, which was, I sort of had two careers. I was, I was a, a, a lawyer from, you know, like 1980 to 1990, and then I went to run a record company, and then in the mid-90s I came back and became a lawyer again. And in my first career I did a lot of shopping. Um, and uh, again, it was more productive then, but even then it wasn't so much more productive. You learned as, you, as time went on that bands didn't, or artists didn't get signed based on some lawyer sending it around or some manager sending it around. It really was pretty much other things. It just, you know, the lawyer could fan the flames once, the, once they started. I mean, and, and, but it was really the, the artist doing the bulk of the work to get noticed and write great songs and get a presence out there and have people notice who they are. So, you know, I just decided it was just such an inefficient process and not all that much, um, uh, and not really very rewarding that I kind of just stopped doing it. And, you know, but on the other hand, I have the luxury of representing a lot of major artists, so you know, if I don't shop the latest new band, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference in my life. But not to say we don't take on new artists, because we do. You know, if I had my preference, uh, it would be when they had their first offer. Um, which, by the way, is mostly how bands do get signed. I mean, again, when I say bands, it's kind of referring to white rock bands. Uh, um, you know, but... Um, but I mean, that would be my preference. They, they probably would like to be earlier so they have somebody they can call up and bother and talk about the industry about, but, you know. 
Well, again, if, if a band's got an offer, I'm a lot more interested. If they got really good management, I'm a lot more interested. Uh, management is also very helpful in the shopping process. And I guess when you say shopping, if you, you, if you include that broadly to, to me, like going out and playing, cutting demos, putting out your own independent records, if that's all part of the shopping process, then I guess it's more productive than to just the idea of, of me as a lawyer getting a demo and calling up an A&R guy and sending it to him. Um, and, you know, so, again, I have the luxury at this point in my career of not having to listen to 300 demos and decide which ones are good. Um, which lawyers are notoriously bad at anyway. Uh, I think part of part of my early success was based on the fact that I was kind of good at it. Um, but it's you know it's ultimately a pretty inefficient process. And when it comes right down to it, I've decided now at this stage of my life, I'd rather listen to m music that I know I'm going to like than stuff that's unsigned stuff that's more likely than not to be kind of crap. You know, I mean, it's not a lot of great bands out there, and and the chances of one of them randomly landing on my desk is, is kind of minimal. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, if you're a young lawyer, what you, should do, uh, what you should do is get to know the NR people. I mean, that's the key is, you know, do what you have to do to get to know the NR people because they're going to be the, you know, they're people you're going to shop to. Uh, and also, you know, the NR people are a good source of, of uh, artists because that's their job to know about most, most artists so they can tip you off to stuff they're interested in or and maybe not be able to sign or maybe they do want to sign them. Um, you know, I, well, that's, that's not true. I'm trying to think. There, there, you know, I, I can tell you my story about Guns N' Roses, which really wasn't an A&R guy who told me about it, but, but it kind of was. I mean, like, I was very friendly with most of the A&R people, and, and there was a really good A&R guy named Tom Zutat back in the day. And there was a, a woman who was managing Guns N' Roses, and her name was Vicki Hamilton, and she'd always invite me to go see her bands, and I'd never make it. And, and, when I, and the reason I'd never make it is because when I say I'm going to go, I actually feel like I should show up, so... Um, so and, and I'd actually, I think, blown off one of them, and I felt really guilty about it. So she said she had this band, Guns N' Roses, that was playing the Troubadour um, that Friday night. And I, and I said, you know, okay, great. And then I had lunch with Tom Zutat, I think, on sur Thursday, and he said he was going to see him. And I go, well, if Tom's going to go see him, they must be pretty good. And so uh, I showed up at the gig, and there were 12 A&R people there. It was incredible. It was like, you know, back in those days, they didn't have the massive uh, A&R swarms that you have today. Or actually, not so much today. It was like about seven or eight years ago. You had the swarms, but um, so, but there were like twelve people, and and I, when I got there at ten, which is when Guns N' Roses was supposed to go on, um, there was still the band before the band before Guns N' Roses. So I'm going, hey, you know what? I'm going home to go to sleep. Then I see twelve A&R people. I go, well, maybe I should stay. And so I stayed. They finally went on at one, and they were amazing. And, and that's you know. And, that's how I ended up working with them. So again, it's partly staying in touch with the ANR people. They they are, they will, they will probably know as much or more about most most artists that people are thinking about than anybody else. It's it's a sort of a shortcut, it's a research shortcut. The job is much harder today because the business is in such bad shape, um, and uh, with all the piracy and everything else, whatever it's affected the music isn't all that good. The business is not that good. Uh, the record companies, which is the primary place where, as a music lawyer, you do business, they're they're all f afraid for their jobs. They're laying people off. They're squeezing every nickel, you know, like it's, you know, they they need the imprint on their thumb, and it's just it's not as fun as it used to be, and it's mostly having to do with the fact that the business is not in very good shape. Mm -hmm. Do you see uh, an out? Um, I have to say that up until recently. I was pretty much thinking it was hopeless. Um, I'm not saying it's. I have. I have. A, I have an idea of what might happen. I'm not. I'm not going to share it. But but I, I have an idea of how things might actually turn out to be okay at some point. Which is not to say that that I don't think things were ever going to turn out okay. I sort of my premise has always been, people want to listen to music and musicians won't work for free. So somewhere in that equation, you're going to get some solution, but I, I, for the life of me, couldn't figure it out. And, you know, you'd sit there and read in Billboard recently or the LA Times the last five years, the, you know, the record industry is not joining the modern age and they're, they're holding back these new technologies that consumers want. And, and I sit there and go, that's a bunch of crap, okay? First of all, these aren't consumers, they're thieves, they don't want to pay. And, and, and everybody's saying, well, you should monetize these new sources of technology. I'm a lot smarter than most people. I can't figure out a way to monetize it. And if somebody could, it would be happening. It's not, 
easy or maybe even doable, but it's certainly not easy. And all these people that say, well, consumers want this and consumers want that. Consumers want free, okay? And, and free is pretty hard to compete with. And so it's a very difficult problem. And, but ultimately, look, the consumers are getting what they want. The more free they get, the less musicians get paid, the less good the music is. You know, and then there's the other argument, well, musicians will do it because they love the music and it'll all be great because they lo they'll do it because they love it. Well, even if you love it, if you can do it 16 hours a day, it's a lot better than if you have a 12-hour shift in McDonald's. You'll write a lot more music if you're not flipping burgers. So even if you love the music, the chances of making more and better music is higher if you're actually getting paid for it. So, I don't know. Let's step back to 1999 or 2000 or whenever we filed that. Um, First of all, it was extremely courageous by Metallica because they took all the crap. But for me, I just got paid, so you know it wasn't. But the the, the thing that was interesting about it was that very early on, uh, we knew, we saw the problem. Uh, I'm not so sure that the record industry, and I'm, I'm just being charitable there, had any idea of how big the problem was. There was all this crap about how sales are better than they ever were, and Napster is flourishing, and you know it was just it just. What, what, what was really going on is the sales would have been even better, except people were stealing and it just wasn't as big a problem. Um, and, you know, there's, there's all these arguments. And frankly, I don't, I don't buy any of them. This thing was a disaster. It was obvious it was a disaster. The Napster case, the, the, the question is whether this litigation is particularly helpful. No, in the long run. In the long run, you're not going to stop technology with litigation. Litigation moves very slowly. Technology moves very fast. The Napster case was actually significant in that it really handicapped the, uh, for lack of a better word, I'll call them thieves, in their ability to uh, purvey their theory because it, the Napster case determined that you can't have like a firewall or a central server. You have to have this decentralized, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, software and, and that made it very vulnerable. Now, having said that, the record companies, I believe, were slow to act on that vulnerability of the, of the peer-to-peer systems and then what we've ingrained is an entire generation that doesn't believe you should pay for music, and I think it's now moved beyond a peer-to-peer -peer problem. It's just problems all over the place. But at least the litigation established some rules that made it a little hard to to propagate the peer-to-peers, and uh, you know, suing. I, I look. I I was. I won't hide it. I was a big advocate in 2000 for suing consumers, and everybody's going, "How can you sue sue our customers?" I go, "They're not your customers. They're stealing your product," and I think. It was the right thing to do, but maybe the timing was too late. Because now it's just there's a whole host of other problems. I mean, you know, somebody somebody uh, buys or steals a CD, they rip it onto their computer, they IM it to everybody in the dorm, and there it is. I mean, I don't know what you do about that. So, so there was an opportunity, I believe, that was lost early on in the battle, and now I think there's just a, a mindset that just doesn't value music anymore or values it very little. And that's, that's sad to me because musicians and, and songwriters work really hard and I think they should be paid. And I think people, you know, even the, you know, well, if they're rich rock stars, they, they have all the money they need. Well, I represent a lot of songwriters that don't make money anymore because they don't get paid because when you, when, you, when you download something and don't pay for it, the songwriter has no way to make money. He can't go on tour. Nobody's going to buy a Billy Steinberg t-shirt or, you know, Diane Warren t-shirt. So they're limited to writing songs. And if there's no money make, made writing songs, they're not going to make any money. I haven't run the economics on an idea of, of uh, taxing the hardware. The big, the big idea five years ago was, you know, uh, add, add, ISP, add a fee to the ISPs. Um, that was the big idea, and everybody's big proponents of that. There are guys that just, just go on and on and on about you should make a deal with the ISPs. And if you, again, I haven't run the numbers on the hardware tax, run the numbers on the ISP tax or the ISP V add-on. What, what do you think people would pay? A dollar, two dollars? There's maybe a hundred million broadband in the United States, probably less. So you're charging a two dollars a month, say, that's 400 million dollars, uh, uh, 200 million dollars a month times 12 months, that's two and a half billion dollars. Used to be a 12 billion dollar industry. The numbers just don't work. I mean, it just doesn't work. I mean, the economics just all fall apart. Now, you can say, well, the industry is too bloated and should be better run, but, you know, again, I'm, I'm happy with that if people aren't buying because they don't like it. They're, if they're not buying because they're taking, that doesn't really work for me. Here's what, here's what I've noticed, and, I, and I've actually... I went to Sundance a couple of weeks ago because Metallica's in a movie there, and they played Sundance, and they were amazing. They were just amazing. And uh, one thing that 
you just notice uh, when you've done this a long time, the artists that have careers, and I mostly only work with career artists, the artists that have careers, there's got to be somebody, the, either the, you know, for solo artists, either they're smart or if it's a band, there's somebody smart in the band. It's not like a lot of actors and actresses who look really pretty, but when you talk to them, you want to basically go out and suffocate yourself or put a pillow over your head till you die. Um, you know, they, they look really great when they're, you know, you're like, oh, I got, she's so hot when she's saying somebody else's words, right? When actually left on their own. A lot of them, not all of them, you know, George Clooney's a smart guy. There are a lot, you know, but there are, there are no artists that I've dealt with over a long period of time that have been successful. Of all my artists, I can't, they're not stupid. They're just, it just does, there is somebody in, if it's a group, the group, or if it's a solo artist, it's the artist that has some really good sense of who they are, what they do, and not business in the, in, in the level that I do it. They don't read contracts, but they get it. They get, you know, they get what they need to get in order to stay where they are. And they all seem to have a very good sense of, the really good artists have a really good sense of, of they, they look at it as art, not about commerce. It's not, you know, how am I going to write that next hit song? Most of the artists I work with just try to, how am I going to make the next great song? That's what they try to do. I mean, they just try to make the next great song. Dr. Dre sp has spent seven years trying to make a greater album than the last one he made. He's not, you know, he's not interested in some hit. He's interested in making the next great album. And that's kind of pretty thematic through most of the artists that I deal with that, you know, at least have had careers for a long time. Uh, again, I don't have a lot of lazy artist clients. I mean, you know, you can see the drive that Lars and James Hetfield have. Dr. Dre is in the studio every single day. You know, he works five days a week, takes weekends off with his family. I mean, you know, the artists I work with, they have to have drive. It's, the business is too hard. There's too many people trying to get to where they are that if you just let it, let it slide, you're going to be able to just kind of phone it in. It just doesn't work. So you have to be, you have to be driven, you have to, and you have to be smart, just like you have to be in pretty much any business that you're successful in. And in the music business, yeah, people get lucky, but I don't see the lucky ones hanging around for a long time. You know, you can get lucky once. You don't get lucky over and over and over again. You pretty much have to be talented. First of all, it's a very bad time to try to get into the music business. Okay, uh, now we're over that. You've decided you want to do it. To me, I mean, the most important thing to me has always been, and I've seen it in, in any artist that, that I've worked with that's gone and be successful, and it's just what I've been talking about, is that, that uh, you really need to, to make you need, really need to make music for the sake of making music. And, and if you're talented, it will connect with the public at large. And if you're not, you'll be pumping gas. But, but the fact of the matter is, if you try to figure out what's going to make the public happy, I can promise you'll be pumping gas. Because if you're not doing it from a set of values and, and doing it from the heart, it's really, really hard to be successful. It's, you know, you have to really, um, Believe in what you're doing and try to do, you know, and try to do it on a level where it's it's where it's it's a passion for you and it's and it's a statement you want to make as an artist. Mm -hmm. It sounds there's various there's various kinds of artists out there. I mean, uh, uh, if you're a hip hop guy, okay, your best thing you can do is go figure out how to get to uh, Jay Z or or Puffy or Dre and or you know Lil John and get on one of their records. You know, that's the best thing you can do is get on one of their records and then and then blow up off of one of their records. If you're a, a, a rock band, the best thing I think you can do is go out there and just, you know, just keep doing it. Don't, you know, don't look for the shortcut. Don't look for the, oh, I'm going to get this guy to shop me or whatever. Just go out and, and play for as many people as you can and keep writing as much as you can and keep recording as much as you can. And like I said, if you have talent, you will ultimately connect if you are driven and you work hard and you're talented. If you're not, well, you know what? I can't play shortstop for the Dodgers. I'm not good enough. I'd like to, but I'm not good enough. So you just keep doing what you do, and and it, it, you know, if you're talented and you work hard, it'll probably pay off. And if you're not, it won't.